How you doing, guys? Thanks for having me. Uh, second time in two years, maybe almost three years ago, presented on drones. And I am still doing drones. Uh, that business is now called Scientific Aerospace. And it is uh, it was my company I started a few years ago to do a management buyout of cyber technology. So cyber technology, founded in 2006, has been leading the uh, unmanned aviation sector. And then scientific aerospace, we've had more of a commercial focus, less defense focus. So we saw, thought we'd drop the, the cyber branding, <clears throat> given can have a few negative connotations, cyber. But I'll mostly be focusing on the uh, my new business, Electro Aero, separate entity to scientific aerospace, um, to focus on sustainable aviation. Okay, so I'll cover three main companies I'm involved with. My drone business, scientific aerospace, Electro Aero, which owns the, uh, the world's first certified electric aircraft, the Alpha Electro down here. You can have a look at after the talk. And hopefully one lucky winner of the uh, raffle will come up for a fly with our instructor, Robert. Uh, Trek Aerospace is a strategic investment I've made in the US, and I'll explain why. And then talk about electro fans and why this, I feel, is a really exciting next wave of, of uh, sustainable aviation propulsion systems. So that's our main uh, product that we developed a couple of years ago to uh, provide a high precision survey. Now the little antenna on the top is really the magic. That antenna is capable of receiving satellite signals from three different constellations at two different frequencies. And some of you will know these acronyms, but I'll explain them. So GPS is the American constellation, GLONASS, uh, Russian constellation, and BIDU is the Chinese constellation. Each of them have a couple of dozen satellites each you could look at maybe just under a dozen of any one constellation, but we're looking at all three. So that little antenna and the onboard uh, GNSS is able of, to track up to 128 and, uh, GPS signals at once. We typically get around 24 to 30 at any one time, uh, based on how many are in the sky uh, versus around the other side of the world. And what we're doing beyond just the number of satellites, that gives you redundancy, but to get the accuracy from meters to, to tens of centimeters to centimeters, we're using a system called PPK, or Post Process Kinematics. I won't get too technical, other than explain that what we then do, once we've got all that information recorded on the aircraft, uh, and we're getting maybe tens of centimeters accuracy using L1 and L2 band, we then do a uh, correction on the atmospheric errors that occurred during that flight to get it from tens of centimeters down to centimeters of accuracy, so that we know where that photo was taken to the nearest two, two and a half centimeters, X, Y, and about five centimeters vertically. So it's majorly accurate technology in a quite a small aircraft that weighs three kilos. So it's uh, come a long way from you know where it used to be a, a brick of tens of well hundred thousand dollars worth of military grade GPS is now the size of a credit card and uh, is on a relatively affordable surveying drone. So as well as the multi rotor, the ducted quad rotor has been our main product. We also have a fixed wing long endurance aircraft. Don't really have time to cover too much, but uh, this is good for structures, 3D modeling around structures. So we can hover around and we can get the detailed, complex shapes of uh, infrastructure like towers, communication towers, power lines, uh, oil and gas plants, flare tips, those sort of assets. But to cover large areas and to start to compete with manned aviation, or at least to find a, an overlap between unmanned um, like drones and the uh, fixed wing manned aircraft, our Lynx Farsight is up to three hours of endurance. So instead of 15 or 20 minutes hovering around, we can fly for up to three hours, battery electric still, still weighs under four kilos. You throw it like a javelin, surveys for many hours, covers hundreds of hectares, about a thousand hectares in a day, comes back and does a deep store landing onto its belly. Uh, the other thing we've branched out, we realize that it's not really a good idea to only be a products company in this space. So we're also a services company. We can provide the service of capturing the data, analytics, post-processing, solution provision. So instead of just being a, a product company and just trying to flog drones, we sort of focus on solutions and working with our customers to tailor them to their needs, provide the training, upgrade their systems when needed, use different spectral sensors. We have a, a few exciting contracts. We have a multi-million dollar three-year development contract to do an aerial spectrometer for defense. So that's a uh, hyperspectral scanner that you can fly over and actually detect the spectrum information. So we have our visible spectrum, we can all see here, red, green, blue. Then there's near infrared, short wave infrared, long wave infrared, all these light spectrums that we can't see, but these spectrometers can see. And it's currently very expensive, very heavy to do a hyperspectral camera. So instead we're working with UWA to do a, a micro spectrometer. It's a tiny little chip, weighs tens of grams, 
and it can scan the spectral range to then characterize what it's looking at. And for the defense application, because that's what's funding it, they want to see improvised explosives. So they want to see if you know there's a explosives residue on that handle or on that car or on that you know suspect package, right? So sending our drone in to scan it and go all clear. Well, mm, yeah, it's raising red flags, you know, just like when you go through the airport and they swab you and they scan it. That is a spectrometer, but that's a active light spectrometer. What we're trying to do is use passive light and fly at least 100 meters away and still detect that. So it's quite challenging. It's not for the faint-hearted and it doesn't exist yet, hence why it's a $3 million program over the next three years. The other things we're doing is being an emergency response support for people like Woodside and others, where we know our drones really well, we know other drones well, that we can have equipment ready to go and personnel ready to go if, heaven forbid, there's an oil spill or if there's another disaster. So positioning ourselves as that go-to place to have equipment ready, people ready to respond is the other aspect of our business because we, we know what we're doing and, and we can sort of be ready and, uh, and that's working really well. So I won't bore you with the business modeling too much, we'll get into the technology. But what I wanted to emphasize is the last decade of drones has really taught me about cost efficient operations and the point and the benefit of drones is that they're so low cost, the sense of electricity to charge the batteries, very low maintenance, all electric, we moved away from petrol drones five or six years ago now, and uh, we just realized it's not worth the, the risk, the cost, the complexity, the safety, the mess, <laughs> the noise, everything is wrong with petrol engine aircraft, and uh, electric really gives us that, um, that operational viability to scale. So that's why I started Electro Aero, and I'll give you the, this is the sort of corporate spiel, and then I'll explain it a bit more after. Electro Aero was founded by Australian innovator, Joshua Portlock, with the vision of safely propelling sustainable aviation. Beyond the environmental benefits, electricity and maintenance of electric aircraft cost significantly less than petrol and engine overhauls, making flying sustainably more affordable. Electro Aero have partnered with Pipistrel, an award-winning light aircraft manufacturer, to represent their Alpha Electro in Australia and facilitate affordable training for new recreational pilots. For commercial pilot training, Electro Aero is the exclusive distributor in the Asia Pacific for Sunflyer from Bayer Aerospace. The Sunflyer is aiming to be the first FAA certified electric aircraft with a proposed flight endurance over three hours, assisted by solar panels on its wings. Electro Aero has invested in Trek Aerospace, the world leader in efficient ducted fan optimization. Together, they developed Flycart, a personal flying go-kart concept that can be transported on a trailer and employs redundant fly-by-wire systems for safety. They are also developing a line of integrated electric ducted fans called Electroducts. These will support a wide variety of VTOL and other aircraft manufacturers who desire safe, compact and efficient propulsion systems. The long-term mission of Electro Aero is to commercialise fleets of electric air taxis to fly passengers quickly and affordably over city traffic and water. For this reason, Electro Aero has developed an automated booking system at rotnest.aero for the existing Rotnest Island air taxi services. This collaboration has further proven the need for electric passenger aircraft. If you would like to collaborate with Electro Aero, please contact them today. So a pretty ambitious vision, but we've realized that the focus point, the, the value add in that sustainable aviation chain is actually the propulsion system. So the ducted fans, <coughs> that really maximize the efficiency of electric propulsion is the value add and the key enabler to really accelerate the adoption of sustainable aviation. So that's why I invested and partnered with Trek Aerospace because they're one of the only companies that have actually designed, manufactured and flight tested a powered lift vertical aircraft. And this aircraft on the left uh, was flown uh, quite a while ago now. It's uh, back in 2005, they did the first flight test on the uh, left here. Um, and that was the, f the world's first powered lift flight, so in uh, 2005. So, um, but that was scary as hell for poor Robert who <laughs> flew that because it was a rotary engine fanging away behind, running through a complex drive system of gearboxes that were all overheating and burning out and uh, tilt mechanisms on the ducts and vanes and, and really expensive yet primitive flight control systems that meant it was a huge amount of pilot skill. Um, and it was very dangerous and they did have some accidents that they don't necessarily publicize. So it's uh, one of those things where lessons learned, learned back then were, yes, it's possible to make powered lift aircraft, 
But is it practical with engines and gearboxes and all the complexity? No, it's actually more dangerous than a helicopter. And yes, helicopters are at least manageably dangerous. <laughs> I think there was a Boeing rotorcraft engineer that presented at a conference and he said, helicopters are thousands of moving parts wanting to separate from each other and our job is to make sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> I thought that's a great line. That, you know, you're basically just trying to stop chaos happening with the helicopter with all that uh, mechanisms that are going on. Whereas electric propulsion does away with all that. You know, you've got a direct drive, electric motor, spinning a propeller, much lower inertia, much lower complexity, wear and tear, vibration, and then you've just got solid state cables, connecting motors, speed controllers, batteries, and you can distribute them, you can have redundancy. There's so many benefits. So this is a concept aircraft uh, called the, so, uh, the Duo Trek. So that was the Solo Trek and then a Duo Trek concept that used quad ducts as a, as a layout. Again, they originally designed this with an engine, right? So engine behind the seat, complex drive systems, and they went, you know what, after all the pain and heartache of the solo trek, let's not even bother making that, it's just too hard, didn't have the funding, put on pause. But the same design, not exact design, but very similar design, can be done with electric now, much cheaper, much lighter, much safer, and um, it's something we're exploring. But at the same time, the regulations are not there yet for powered lift. The only certified powered lift in the world right now is technically the V-22 Osprey, if you don't count jet propulsion. Like uh, the Joint Strike Fighter is technically a powered lift, but it's predominantly jet thrust. The only propeller-driven VTOL transitioning aircraft is the V-22. And as you may or may not know, it has cost a fortune. It has blown out budgets. It has taken way longer. It's killed a lot of pilots. It's been a complete nightmare of a program. Um, and it's because of the mechanical complexity of drive shafts going through the wing to give redundancy between the jet engines on each wing tip, right? So the, the propulsion system has still hurt that program, but also just the fundamentals of that um, dead man's curve between hover and cruise. It's pretty easy to make things hover. It's pretty easy to make things cruise on a wing. It's really hard to get between the two <laughs> states, <laughs> right? So and it's really hard to do it safely, repeatedly, reliably with fault tolerance and, and whatnot. So that's really our focus. With electro ducts and electro fans, as we call them, as a complete propulsion so solution, we can offer these propulsion systems to air framers and give them something that really makes a difference. So this is the Flycut as a technology demonstrator to prove that it is possible to fly a uh, hover, an eight rotor aircraft capable of carrying a person. We haven't carried a person simply out of liability and risk, but we have carried the equivalent weight in sandbags and we've demonstrated it can carry 100 kilos of sand. So theoretically, we could be flying around with these today, but, so technically it's possible, but is it practical? Is it certifiable? No. And is it, is it safe? Yes, but you still are at the mercy of some single points of failure. So while we have a triple redundant autopilot system, or we have eight redundant propellers, uh, you, you still have this certain bottlenecks in the whole ecosystem that if some certain electronics fail or some you know, its component fails, you can still fall, fall out of the sky, and that's just unacceptable. So we're constantly working with aviation, uh, avionics manufacturers to improve the redundancy and fault tolerance of all the components. Um, but for now, we've at least pr proved propulsive-wise, you can, with eight or more fans, and even six theoretically, you can have redundancy. So, and that's the most important thing in my mind, is ingestion redundancy. Because once we've made these as reliable and efficient as possible, um, then they're not going to fail. They're just fundamentally not going to fail on a normal operation. You can see that propeller's turned off. And we're about to hover with seven. And apart from the audible noise of two fans working a little harder next to the, the one that's off, you can't tell from a stability control point of view, it flies just the same. And yeah, those two fans either side are working a little harder, so you've got to have them thrust margin for that. But that's why more the merrier. So the more ducts you have, say 12, 18, whatever, then if one fails, it actually matters even less because it's such a small margin of, of uh, thrust. So that's ingestion redundancy, but then you've got avionics redundancy. This is in entirely fly-by-wire stability controlled. There's no way a human can fly the differential mixing between all eight of those fans. So you're dependent on that avionics always working, always flawlessly working. Now our drones, they, they don't have any avionics problems, so I'm comfortable with avionics being reliable. But there's still the fundamental risk of uh, avionics having an issue, a bug, uh, uh, you know, EMI error, an issue with the communication buses, whatever it may be, it's not acceptable to have that failure cause a fatality in an aviation scenario. 
So not only will we do triple redundant avionics, meaning there's three auto parts that are independent, possibly even independently produced, but have the same input output requirement, um, and then they must go on a redundant communication bus to communicate to all of the motors and speed controllers. Because if your weakest link is that they're all connected to one bus, and then that bus goes down, you know, it's pointless having three auto parts telling you what to do if they can't tell the fans what to do. So you really have to think the whole value proposition from like electrons being uh, stored in a battery, so redundant batteries, redundant disconnect mechanisms if a battery fails, to redundant speed controller internals, so if a FET fails, how do you reconfigure that speed controller? Redundant auto parts, we talked about the buses, the communication buses that talk to it, all the devices. The motors themselves are some clever things you can do. You can split phase a motor, so you can run, you know, these are, uh, these are three phase motors. So they have three windings, they go in and back out, and you have three cables. But technically you can split that into six cables and have two parallel windings inside the one motor and have two separate speed controllers driving those two windings. So if you have a winding fail, if you burn out a winding, you've still got at least half the power. And in fact, it works out better than that. It's about 75% of the power because you've now got the thermal mass of the other dead winding to dissipate heat. So if you've got you know, a 25% loss in power because one of your windings fail, that's a hell of a lot better than 100% loss of power, right? So there's things that can be done like that. Um, and that's all part of our like, ecosystem is designing for other aircraft manufacturers to use our propulsion systems and uh, working with them rather than trying to you know, start from scratch building aircraft and, and compete. This is a pretty cool design though. This is our next generation Flycart. So this is Flycart 2, which is a evolution on Flycart 1, which chucked a couple more ducts on and made it look really sexy. But um, the aim was that uh, this is actually to compete in a competition in the US called the, the Hero X Go Fly Challenge. Its key sponsor is a Boeing. It's a million dollar prize pool. Uh, for having the, the winning aircraft, and there's three categories that they, com that they uh, compete against. The Go Fly Challenge is a challenge to carry one person up to 20 miles away in as quick a time as possible, in the lowest noise footprint, in the smallest physical footprint possible. And those three things are what are driving the challenge. Quietest, smallest, fastest. And in that order, they want the quietest first and foremost, least disruption to the neighborhood, so jet engines are out, uh, mostly electric at this rate, maybe with some exotic other techniques, but um, the uh, um, compact means you can be no wider than a car, so they say no bigger than um, eight foot maximum individual dimension, and they prefer to be the whole aircraft under six foot, this is six foot diameter aircraft, so th just under um, two meters. So it can fit on a trailer, it can fit on a shipping container, and it can fit in a car parking bay. So you, you land on a rooftop and roll it into a car parking bay and, and go to work. Now it's very ambitious, it's very futuristic, it's very out there. I'm not holding my breath for this actually being commercially viable, but it's pretty exciting that there's a million dollar prize pool to have a go. And there's 6,000 registered competitors for this. 6,000 people around the world are competing for this competition. So it's not like you know just a you know a few people are interested in this. There's a serious movement going towards personal flight. So we're we're getting taking a part of it, or being getting involved with it. So yeah, it's pretty pretty fun looking aircraft. It's not aerodynamically the most like optimal, but it's it's safe and futuristic looking, and it's got that sex appeal that that kind of stimulates the enthusiasm around uh, personal flight. And to explain electrofans more, so while we have the little 40 centimeter ones on Flycart, um, they're great for little personal flight aircraft and we're selling them to a bunch of people who want to uh, build scale models of their eventual air taxis. This is uh, our, one of our designs called the Electrofan 80. It's a modular 80 centimeter ducted fan that we've already produced and are testing and, uh, and that's enough thrust that one of those could propel a single person fixed wing aircraft, a 300 or so kilo takeoff weight. Two of them can comfortably propel a 600 kilo light sport aircraft, a two seater. So you can have two of them uh, on the rear of a fuselage and, and propel uh, an aircraft very efficiently. And the most important factor is, is its conversion efficiency from electron to uh, thrust. So the duct augments that thrust so that you're getting at least 40% up to 50% more thrust for the same electrical power. And more importantly, you flip that around, you say, I only need so much thrust to take off. So for the same thrust, to compare to an open propeller, we're using 33% less power. And that's what really matters, because that's 50% more flight time for the same battery size. 
So that's, that's huge. That takes our alpha from a one hour flight time to an hour and a half, you know. It takes an aircraft that was barely marginally viable to now viable, you know. So that conversion of electrons from batteries to, uh, to thrust is really important. That's the static thrust. Cruise efficiency is also more improved, up to about 200 knots. So this is optimized for static thrust and about 100 knot, 120 knot cruise, so 200 kilometers an hour. When you get to about 200 knots, then you need to re-optimize the duct for high-speed cruise, but we're not trying to compete in that space. Electric batteries are far from being able to um, power a high-speed aircraft, so we're just focusing on that low-speed flight environment where you can get to Rock Nest in 12 minutes, you can get to Mandra in half an hour, you can get to Busselton in an hour. That's still more than fast enough. It's still double traffic speed. It's still, not to mention, actual traffic of slowing you down. So you're probably getting to most places, when you're crossing a city, most places you can fly about four times faster or in a quarter of the time that you could drive. And that's the, the eventual goal of electric aviation is it's not just a, a leisurely thing to do, it's not just recreational, it's a mode of transport. Because we can fly with electroducts more efficiently per passenger kilometre than a Tesla Model S. So substantially more efficiently than a petrol engine aircraft, but even better than the best optimised ground transport uh, electric vehicle. And it all comes down to drag. Coefficient of drag on a Tesla Model S is 0.3, which is phenomenal, most are around 0.4 or 5, so credit to them. Our aircraft are nominally 0 0.03, 0.04. So it's that tenfold magnitude in drag reduction means we can fly twice as fast and use half the power. So it's just a game changer. Once you're flying efficiently on a wing-borne flight, you can transport A to B people co more cost-effectively than a, than a ground vehicle. So we can fly to uh, Murray Field for about $1.20 in electricity and it would take about $3 in a Tesla. So it's just a game changer in, in transportation cost. So I won't get too technical, but I mentioned the benefits of thrust all the way to about 200 knots. And that's huge, like that's a 40% improvement in thrust, that's static, and a 50%, if not more, at the cruise speeds we're typically flying. So you know, you've got all that extra thrust, all that less power being consumed. The efficiency is really a function of tip clearance. So getting that tip clearance as minimal as possible, the optimum would be zero, right? If the, if the propeller touched the wall without any friction, but practically you have manufacturing tolerances, weight considerations, so it's all that optimization around the duct structural rigidity, stiffness and lightweight that we've focused on, and that manufacturing expertise is what's going to make us competitive with these ducts. And half as loud, and that's to an open propeller. It's about a tenth as loud as an engine, but about half as loud as an open propeller. So as you'll see when uh, Rob taxis the Alpha back away from here, um, it's very quiet already, but you're still hearing tip noise, still hearing propeller tip noise. And that's because you've got that in inefficient vortice being generated around the tips. We don't have that issue. In the ducted fan, the duct is guiding the flow past the tips, and you're getting a full spanwise efficiency of the prop. So you're getting an order of 85% figure of merit rather than sort of 45-50% figure of merit. Uh, cruise benefits we talked about, but uh, just to explain, this is a duct tilt versus cruise. So in a hover, you're using like nearly 40 kilowatts to produce uh, a certain amount of lift, say 80 kilograms of, of hover as an example. When you start tilting it forward, the amount of power you need, and this is with no wings, just to clarify, this is just the duct alone, produces extra augmented lift from the new fresh air coming over the duct that it actually drops off the amount of power you actually need. Up to about uh, 70 knots, it can lift its own weight. It can do the same weight that it was doing VTOL just from the forward flight coming, air coming over it. And when you're cruising along at a, a full horizontal duct, because this is, this is only showing up to 15 degrees, and the next part is even more exciting, that once it's horizontal, it drops off again to about half that power again. And as long as you have a combination of wings and other control surfaces to fly, you can actually use like a tenth of the power you need in hover. So your hover power, when you take off, using a fair bit of power, VTOL aircraft are, are power hungry by nature. Um, but then when you transition that aircraft, you tilt those ducts forward and you have a combined wing-borne flight for high L over D and duct lift, because the ducts produce lift, they're an annular wing you now are using a tenth of the power. So instead of 10 minutes of flight time, you've got 100 minutes of flight time, or 20 to 200 or whatnot. And there's that interesting little trade-off in optimizing the wing area and whatnot, but I'm leaving that to our airframe partners. We're just making the best propulsion system we can to enable them. It's a tool for them to go and make the best aircraft around it. I uh, won't get too technical here, but just that, again, that thrust endurance versus the so max power endurance versus the cruise. So you know, you're throttling back a lot. You don't need nearly as much thrust in cruise as you do in hover. So you start with a lot of power, 
but then you can dial it back and, and cruise. Uh, this is one example aircraft, a gyrocopter. You're probably familiar with gyrocopters. This is a very clean, streamlined composite tandem seater, which is a perfect fit for our ducted fans because you mount them either side. They also now have clean air intake, right? Guess where more than half of your energy is wasted on a propeller? Blowing air over the fuselage. So it's really inefficient at the moment to have this big bulky engine in the way of your propeller, and it'd be even worse with the duct being smaller and more compact. If you had a big engine behind it, you'd wasted all that efficient movement of air if it's now having to go around something like an engine. So putting them either side gives you clean air intake, clean exhaust, low drag, low noise, all sorts of benefits. And now you have redundancy as well. You've got twin redundancy. So I think everyone here would prefer to fly twins where they can, apart from the cost. So that's the other factor is we've got twin redundancy cheaper than a single, cheaper than a single to build, to make, to fly, a lot cheaper to operate, a lot cheaper to maintain. Uh, again, this is an example with that aircraft, we can get over 90 minutes of endurance from a gyrocopter. And that's unheard of, like for, uh, if you just converted, if you just replaced the engine with a propeller, electric propeller, sorry, um, you'd only get about 40, 45 minutes. So by having those twin ducts either side and cleaning up the airflow, reducing drag, we can get that double endurance out of the existing battery technologies. We don't need anything exotic, this is using existing batteries. And this is a really exciting one, and you're probably the first people to see this publicly, So, and we're not overly publicizing it, so it's really just for a VIP audience like this. This is our electro jet concept. So it's a five seat passenger jet aircraft, one pilot, we still believe in pilots, and four uh, passengers to do things like the Rottnest Air Taxi flights. So currently done by Cessnas and, and uh, Piper Cherokee Sixes. We could do all of the, we could do 85% of the bookings with this aircraft. Right now we have, uh, from the year, we've had bookings through our system, our automated booking system. 45% of the flights are two passengers, a couple, want to go to Rottnest for the, the day. They're time poor and, and financially can justify the cost of the Cessna. Um, so that's a very popular combination. Then you've got 40% is a family, a young family, two adults, two kids. Collectively, they weigh less than 300 kilos. So it's not like you need a full 400 kilos of passenger mass. You can get away with a 300 kilo passenger mass and transport 85% of the people who fly to and from Rottnest um, with an aircraft like this. It'd be twin, redundancy, you know, people who are nervous about flying a single engine over the water here, that would you know, quell that concern. Um, the engine, uh, the electric motors are behind you, so it's quieter than a big donkey engine in front of you. And, uh, and streamline, and, and the, this is the other factor where we can get much lower drag coefficients with this pointy streamline fuselage. This is a like 0.1 coefficient fuselage, uh, sorry, 0.01 coefficient fuselage, because it's basically just the optimum, you know, least drag kind of glider style fuselage, instead of this big donkey engine on the front that, that dictates the shape of the whole nose. Um, yeah, so I can harp on about it all day, but I will wrap up there, and what I'll emphasize is that the future is electric, and it's exciting times, and it starts with the Alpha, which you're welcome to come fly. You're welcome to come down to the uh, apron and see the Alpha Electro.